This is Mr. Wallace, your driver education instructor, and we are doing the final part of lesson seven. Uh, steering wheel grip, guys. Uh, we, oh, that's not going to work, and that's fine. We'll stay right in this format here. Uh, the grip on the wheel is important. If you, uh, if you do grip the wheel too tightly, you may oversteer your vehicle. Um, at the same time, you don't want to be palming the wheel with one hand. Uh, the ideal grip is nine and three o'clock. And that's to allow for, in case you have an accident, the airbag will not be uh, hitting your arms very much. Your arms should be safe. Whereas if you were at the 10 and two up here, uh, it would be more likely that your arms would be damaged uh, in the case of an accident when the airbag inflated. Okay, so let's move along to the next slide. And maybe I can hit present at the point, okay. So some common steering errors include, uh, well, let's see what it says. Research shows that a substantial percentage of cheat of crashes involving 16 year old drivers result from failure to make a quick turn or from improper evasive steering. Of the three controls a driver has when driving, which are accelerating, braking, and steering, steering is the primary function. Uh, and it's the easiest or the best way to avoid an accident, right? Evasive steering. Okay, what is the steering error that is that new drivers sometimes commit? One of them is oversteering. So for example, making a right-hand turn and uh, not clearing uh, the, the turn, for example, and the back wheels come up onto the curb. That's a very typical uh, steering error by young new drivers. Okay, keeping the car straight. This is lane positioning, and this is Again, in the parking lot. The center of the lane is the safest place to drive. In order to stay there, teens need to learn to drive straight. The best time and place to practice driving straight is when a nearby parking lot is empty and as free of cars and pedestrians as possible. Now, parking lots do not have any lane markings like roads, but don't let that stop you from practicing lane positioning. In place of markings, your family can use cones, boxes, or the parking space lines as a guide. Another option is to encourage the new driver to imagine a yellow line. In this activity, have your teen driver practice driving straight while following markers you've set up or imagining a yellow line to the left of the car as a guide. You'll both notice it's not easy for a teen driver to keep the car straight. It will take a few tries to master, but worth the effort. At first, some teen drivers may tend to grab the steering wheel too tightly and hold their arms very rigid. If that's the case, encourage them to loosen their hold to a firm yet relaxed grip on the wheel. Another common error for a teen driver is they may fixate too much on the center line to keep their car straight. Remind them that they need to also keep their eyes on the road ahead. They'll strike the right balance, but until they do, keep practicing in the parking lot. With some practice, driving straight should begin to feel natural and less of an effort, and their confidence will grow. Keep practicing until it feels comfortable. It'll come. I do want to say that is excellent practice there in the parking lot. Uh, using those straight white or yellow lines, they're usually white, uh, as kind of a guideline. And you can also set up cones uh, either on the same line or on the opposite uh, at the end of those parking white lines to create a lane and then practice driving straight in the lane. Uh, but very, very uh, excellent um, practice there. I do that all the time with my students. Okay, starting and stopping and turning in the parking lot. Uh, what was your experience like the first time that you pressed the brake pedal? Was it nice and gentle? Probably not, right? If you're anything like me, you probably stabbed it and you jerked, your head jerked forward. Uh, your parent was probably really upset. <laughs> that was my experience, I know that. Uh, how do you manage speed on a little course like this one? Uh, we'll see, but um, I'll answer the question now. 
we manage the brake. We manage speed by using the brake, right? So we're going to be, uh, our foot's going to be almost exclusively on the brake pedal, either hovering or depressing it. And, and that's the speed we're going to do in the parking lot. We're rarely going to use the accelerator in a parking lot. Stopping and starting is all about getting used to the feel of the gas and brake pedals. This is an important technique for keeping the car under control and providing a smooth ride for your passengers. This activity will provide practice in braking and accelerating. Before you and your team start the practice drive, place boxes or cones in an L shape around the lot. After you have your markers in place, get back in the car and begin your practice. Instruct your team driver to drive up to each box and come to a complete stop. Then progress on to the next marker and continue to encourage your team to accelerate and stop as smoothly as they can. Stop at each marker until you've driven around the outside of the L. Expect some sudden stops and accelerations. That's normal for team drivers. It's difficult for an inexperienced driver to judge how much pressure to use until he or she gets a good feel for it. During this exercise, also take some time to think about how your team driver is turning. This is another skill which needs to be developed before a driver gets on the road for the first time. Here's a few tips about turning. Slow down just prior to the turn. Turn your head in the direction of the turn before turning the wheel and look for obstructions or pedestrians. Smoothly accelerate and turn the wheel simultaneously. Oversteering is a common error for teen drivers when they are turning. This may happen if the teen driver is gripping the steering wheel too tightly. Have them keep a firm yet relaxed grip. Drive around the L until the teen driver becomes confident in stopping, starting, and turning. You'll find with practice what was once a jerky ride will soon become much smoother. Okay, so uh, so we saw there that we really are going to be um, depressing or hovering over the brake when we are managing speed, let's say less than 15 miles per hour, definitely less than 10 miles per hour. And we're doing a lot of hand work there while we make while we're making our turns. One of my little phrases that I like to use is slow car and fast hands. Slow car and fast hands gets the job done every time. That's my little saying. Uh, and what it is is basically you can maneuver the car a lot more when it's going slowly and when you're moving your hands quickly. So slow car, fast hands always gets the job done. These are great exercises and if you and if you are in the parking lot and you feel like okay we just uh we can't practice because those cones or those boxes are too close together well just space them out a little even more so you can get a feel for just coasting up to the next cone or 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 box uh i strongly recommend you do get uh yourselves cones um and one way you can do that too is checking with your local like your city or your state uh, Department of Transportation, they often have used cones that they don't even want anymore, and they're almost willing to donate them to uh, to student drivers. Okay, let's move on. <coughs> Starting. Here we go. Operating the foot pedal, right? So when operating the foot pedal, it yep, I require my students to wear good shoes. No flip flops, no wide sole shoes, no high heels, for example. Uh, because we want our heel to be right there on the floor of the car and to be able to pivot between the accelerator and the brake, right? And we can start practicing that even more What if we make the cones wider or farther in distance in the parking lot. Or, for example, if we, are, um, if we get into our residential area, we can definitely start to... Uh, to start pivoting and using our accelerator, right? Not a lot, but enough to get us up to speed as we're driving down a residential road at around 30 miles per hour, okay? Remember, we're pivoting here with our foot and our heel is on the floor. Okay, accelerating the vehicle. Uh, there are four levels of acceleration, guys. There's like idling acceleration, which refers to coasting, that's when you're not pressing down on the gas and you're not using the brake at the same time. So, for example, if your car was in park and your foot was depressed on the brake, 
you can take your foot off the brake and your car will move forward, right? And that's like idling acceleration. Light acceleration is when you're moving along already and you're holding and you, you're holding your foot on the accelerator steadily and lightly, right? So there's no increase in speed. You are just giving the car gasoline so it can maintain a speed, okay? That's usually, you know, it could be any speed. It could be 30 miles per hour. It could be 55 miles per hour. Okay, progressive acceleration is when you gradually build up to your desired speed, right? So, for example, you come out of a turn, right? And then you're going to just depress gently on your brake or on your acceleration pedal until it gets you up to the desired speed right and then of course there is thrust acceleration which of course is everyone's favorite and that's when you really stab down on the acceleration pedal with your foot and your car should respond by moving quickly accelerating quickly and increasing speed quickly uh an ideal place for this for example is uh when you are on an on-ramp, uh, getting onto a throughway or, or an expressway, and you need to get up to speed and you don't have a lot of time or distance to do that, then you're really going to press hard on your accelerator. You're going to make that engine hum and you're going to get up to speed. Okay, braking. <laughs> Just like there are four levels of accelerating, there are also four levels of decelerating, right? So, the first one is the, is almost like the opposite of the other one. It's when we release the accelerator. If you're moving along at 30 miles per hour and you release the accelerator, your car is going to start slowing down. Okay. And this is going to be pretty much our reaction to any time when we see a situation ahead of us that requires our judgment. The first thing we will always do is release the accelerator. Okay. That will buy you time because it slows the car down. Okay, controlled squeeze is when you actually pivot your foot over to the, to the brake and depress the brake, right? <laughs> Remember, anything over 20% is a braking action and can't be considered really slowing your car down, right? So we have this quite often, for example, we're driving along in any type of uh, road and something uh, let's think about this one. We're driving along an expressway and someone cuts us off and we can no longer drive at the desired speed. We use this controlled braking maneuver uh, and we just gently depress the brake to bring us down to uh, a safe speed. <clears throat> Happens all the time. We, we all know it. Okay, threshold braking. This is using most of the brake available without a full sudden brake to a stop. Okay, so you are really pushing down on the brake to really bring yourself down to speed. But the intention is not to come to a full stop. The intention is to really, really get from, for example, let's we're going 55 miles per hour and we see up ahead of us, there's uh, without very much distance, all the cars are stopped in the middle of the road for some stoppage. <clears throat> and we really, really, really need to get our car down to uh to a safe speed. Maybe the cars aren't stopped, they're only just going like two, five, 10 miles per hour. And we really bring that car down from 55 miles per hour down to around five miles per hour. Okay, that's gonna be a threshold break. Okay, trail braking is the kind of emer this emergency braking. This is when we are totally slamming on the brakes and we are we are trying to stop our vehicle, okay? And uh, I call it trail braking because you usually leave a trail on the on the pavement, right? And uh, and it's, it's the trail of your wheels. Okay. <clears throat> okay. And yep, we will be dependent on our anti brake system to prevent total loss of control on when we are doing trail braking. Tips on using the primary and secondary controls. Uh, parking brake, when to use it, use it on hills, guys. That's the only time when we really need to use it, uh, if at all. I would not recommend using it for a an automatic uh, transmission car. Cruise control, again, I'm not. I will flat out recommend that you do not use this as you as you are learning to drive. Avoid speed control or cruise control. 
<laughs> yep, and we do have special technology that helps us identify lane drifting. Uh, I don't like using this, guys, because I like you to change your position in lanes, even on highways, and uh, this technology usually gets in the way. Okay, I prefer not to use it. I prefer to turn that, uh, that piece of technology off. Okay, let's get to scanning, okay? Why must great drivers use scanning techniques? What does scanning, how does scanning work? And what is a good environment and a good time to practice in that environment for beginner drivers? Drivers who scan well see potential dangers early enough to avoid crashes. Good scanning comes with experience. Unfortunately, inexperienced drivers tend to focus only on what's directly ahead of them. That's why this lesson is so important. A scanning routine will get your new driver to expand their area of focus so they can spot potential hazards. Remind your team to adjust the mirrors every time they get behind the wheel. This will help maximize their area of visibility. During your practices in the parking lot, instruct your team to practice the scanning routine recommended by their driving instructor. It may be a variation on this routine. Check your side mirror, check your rear view mirror, check your other side mirror, and then look up ahead in the direction the car is moving. It's important to feel comfortable with this routine before you and your team venture out onto the road. <clears throat> Obviously, there aren't many potential hazards in an empty parking lot. So take this time to practice the scanning routine. Make sure it is well understood. While you are discussing scanning, it's also a great time to go over the concept of blind spots. Every vehicle has them to varying degrees. Blind spots are the areas to the sides of the vehicle that are not covered by any of the mirrors. The driver needs to physically turn their head to see something in their blind spot. Stress to your teen driver how vital it is to check their blind spot whenever they make a lateral move, change lanes, turn onto another road, or into a parking space. Also mention that it's important not to linger in anyone's blind spot too long when the new driver gets out on the road. It takes practice to get used to scanning. One thing you should watch for is that your teen driver doesn't turn the steering wheel as they turn their head to scan. This is a common mistake of new drivers. With practice, your teen driver will excel at scanning and be ready to advance from the parking lot. Okay, that is, uh, that's, that scanning, guys, is one of our crucial skills that we will be developing in this course. It makes good drivers great drivers when we scan and we react to potential hazards okay so scanning uh why do we use it because it is the pretty much the essential primary or first uh action that we do in the uh with the total action of defensive driving okay so we are looking for potential hazards and we're and we're predicting them okay so uh, and we have potential has the potential hazards are different in different environments, right? And when we have an empty parking lot, the potential hazards are very, very minimal. Um, and this is why we want to practice in, in parking lots. <clears throat> in every other environment, they become uh, more pronounced, uh, especially depending on the time of day. Okay, so how does scanning work? We use our vision and we have uh, three different types of vision. And we, use, we employ all three of them to help us uh, identify potential hazards. So we have a core vision, which is kind of right in the front of us and is for focusing. And then we have our fringe, which makes up uh, the rest of the kind of the uh, part of the road that we can actually see and take in and take in information. And then we have our peripheral vision, which is all out to the sides, uh, which just only really detects movement and color, uh, but together, uh, using those and using our mirrors, we are then totally uh, cognizant of potential hazards around us, and we can manage them, uh, and we'll be learning about that quite a bit in our course, okay? Uh, was a good environment to practice in after moving out of the parking lot? Uh, the next easiest environment for you to practice scanning, guys, is really residential area. Uh, usually early in the morning um, or even mid-morning, like around 
10 a.m., there's just not a lot of action happening in a residential area. Uh, a great time to practice for, for beginner drivers, right around 10 a.m. Nothing's going on. Everyone's already gone to work. Uh, the kids are already in school. So it's the perfect time to, to practice moving around in a residential area. There's almost no traffic. And that's the ideal place. And I'm hoping that you are finding these places uh, while you go out doing your drives. Drivers who scan well see potential. There you go. Okay, and checking under under the hood, we're going to get more into this at the very end of our course. But uh, I would love for you to spend some time with your parent uh, going through, maybe even just getting out your tablet and uh, looking on the PDF of your owner's manual for the car and opening up the hood and just identifying where each one of these uh, things is in your car. It's important to know where they are, right? You have, you should know where the battery is so that you can get a jump or jump another car. Okay. That should be clean. Uh, should have a nice charge to it. Although I don't expect you to, to, uh, to see that if you need to clean it one way, there are cleaners uh, that you can buy uh, even in Walmart or almost any place. Um, you can always go to an auto parts store and, and buy some cleaner for your battery. They'll tell you what to do. In fact, they'll even go out and show you how to do it. Okay, engine coolant reservoir. You should know where this is and you should be able to recognize uh, you know, how much is in there, okay? Uh, by the way, do not open this thing uh, if your car has been running, okay? There's a reservoir uh, over to the side where there, there should be some type of label about what your level is, okay? Power steering fluid reservoir, you should be able to identify where that is. Uh, drive belts, so tension and wear, you should just be able to, usually there's one big serpentine belt. You should be able to look at that. And if you look online uh, on YouTube, and we will together later on, you'll be able to recognize a, a new belt versus an old and fraying belt. Uh, engine oil dipstick, right? This is definitely someplace, uh, something you should be able to identify and actually pull out and wipe off and then stick back in and get uh, a gauge of how much engine oil you have left in your engine. Uh, there is a trans transmission fluid dipstick. Also, this is for automatic transmission only. And you can also check that out and uh, go into more depth again online using YouTube for your car. Uh, there's another one with brake fluid and the air filter assembly too. So if you guys are really interested in your car and kind of self-maintenance for your car, uh, these are all very, um, very useful things to check out. Now, if you don't like doing that, and I understand, this is pretty much, guys, a lot of this here, checking these things out and topping them off is what happens when you take your car in for an oil change, okay? And you should be taking your car in for an oil change every three to 5,000 miles, okay? Depending on the type of oil you have in your car, the type of car you have, and maybe even how hard you, you drive your car, okay? But that's what they're doing. They're checking these things out for you. Okay, and this is where these things are under the, under the hood. And some of these I can identify right away. Uh, here's your engine coolant right here. Uh, there's, um, let me just move this out of the way. Sorry, guys. Hmm. Okay, here's where your engine oil goes. This is the dipstick for your engine oil. This is, I believe, uh, it's either transmission or brake fluid here. And this one uh, is your windshield wiper uh, fluid, and that's going to be a blue one, okay? And there's going to be a little symbol on it that shows your windshield washer uh, fluid, okay? I'm just looking for where the radiator, the coolant, uh, usually there might be a big uh, opening where you can also, I think it's probably right here, and you don't want to open that up when the, when the car has been running. Uh, it will spray out and because uh, it's under pressure um, and it is extremely hot. I mean, we're well over the, the boiling temperature of water. The last thing over here, here's the serpentine belt. Okay. And that looks like brand new. Looks in very, very good condition. It's nice and black. 
doesn't look like it's frayed at all. Uh, that's how you want it to look. Okay, so I'm gonna, yeah, so a dipstick for oil, uh, windshield washer fluid. That's the coolant reservoir here for your radiator. Here is the oil uh, where you will pour, pour in oil and you can do it when, while your engine's hot if you need to top it off before you bring it in to get an oil change. Right, and yeah, and we did this already. So um, <clears throat> those will be your cylinders uh, or valves for your car. Okay, four, that's a four cylinder car, it's pretty small, small engine. And that's it for today. I hope uh, this helps you while you're taking your quiz. Um, and again, this was the last part of today's lesson. Have a great day.